Good evening and welcome to SOAS University um, and welcome to this event about the Shamima Begum case. Uh, before we get things started, I just want to give you a little bit of context to this event. So uh, we're a group called SOAS ICOP. ICOP is an acronym for Influencing the Corridors of Power, which sounds like a really ambitious aim, but uh, <laughs> that's what we, we attempt to do. We're a group of um, students, former students, and academics who um, do a number of things in order to try to have some kind of influence in the way that MPs vote on particular bills. So one of the things we do is we produce one-page briefings about issues that are in, important to us, and our remit is quite broad. So um, some, uh, an issue like prevent would be something that we would be concerned about. That's the government's counter um, extremism policy. So we would try to um, bring experts together to author these briefings. We also hold events in SOAS and in Parliament. Um, so uh, the, the other thing that we've done is we've set up an all-party parliamentary group and um, we are basically trying to bridge the gap between Westminster and um, uh, the world of academia. So that's the context of this event. Um, and. I've just put a few notes up on here, but you can uh, find out more about us if you just follow us on Twitter, at SOAS ICOP, and then we can let you know if we have uh, more of these events coming up, which we will uh, be having very soon. Um, so please do follow us. And um, as I mentioned today, we're looking at the Shamima Begum case. Uh, we have the journalist, investigative journalist Josh, Josh Baker here, and um, Shamima Begum's family lawyer, Tasneem Kunji. And uh, the discussion is going to be chaired by SOAS's Professor Alison Scott Bauman. Uh, before I call them to the stage, I'm just going to play a very quick introduction to um, Josh's documentary, uh, The Shamima Begum uh, Story. I'm curious about how you think people perceive you. As, as a danger, as a risk, as a potential risk to them, to their safety to their way of living. Do you understand why society has so much anger towards you? Yes, I do understand. But it's, I don't think it's actually towards me. I think it's towards ISIS, but when they think of ISIS, they think of me because I've been put on the media so much, you know? But they only did that because you chose to go to ISIS. But what was there to obsess over? We went to ISIS, that was it, it was over. They just wanted to continue the story because it was a story, it was the big story. But you do accept that you did join a terrorist group? Yes, I did. Three friends stride confidently through Gatwick Airport, heading to war-torn Syria. Hundreds and hundreds of Western Muslims have been attracted to this death cult. Shamima has become a lightning rod, a polarizing figure. I don't trust her. I think she's dangerous. I think she's radicalized. Was she trafficked? Was she groomed? When you throw your lot in with the devil, don't expect the niceties of what Western democracies and Western justice stand for. They were children. They were manipulated. We have probably let this child down at some point. Could Shamim Begum have been prevented from reaching ISIS? There would have been a possibility, yes. They can't expect us to come back to the UK and be welcomed with open arms. I think she shouldn't come back. She's made her choice. It's really complex. She's really complex. She was radicalised here. It's our mess and we should clear it up. The runaway ISIS bride has had her British citizenship revoked. If you did know what I knew, you would have made exactly the same decision. Of that, I have no doubt. And I'd like to welcome Alison, Josh and Tasneem to the stage. Hello. Thank you for all coming. Yeah. Working? Can you hear us? Lovely to see you here. 
you this evening. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Alison Scott Bowman. I lead the, the work that Nina's been talking about, and I'm a professor in the School of Law. I'm not a lawyer, but I do a lot of work with law and lawyers because, as you probably noticed, the current government, one of its devices is to try to undermine the rule of law and the courts and the judges and the barristers. So it's great to be positioned in the law department. I'm very happy with that. I'm actually a philosopher, but we're not going to talk about that this evening. Um, I'd like to introduce Josh Baker. This is such a brilliant lineup. Uh, he's the award-winning documentary filmmaker. That I do commend. Can you just put your hands up? Uh, it's not a shaming. It's really for fact. Uh, can you put your hand up if you've seen the film? Oh, wow. Thank you so much. That's good. That's good. Um, so he's an investigative journalist. He's a podcast creator and he's a writer. He created the 10-part BBC podcast, I Am Not a Monster. Uh, a four-year investigation of one family's journey to the heart of ISIS-controlled Syria and their return to America. Now, I can't put my hand up on this one, but are there, are there people who... Mm. Guys. <laughs> it's brilliant. Send That's... me an invoice. Oh, your money. Thank you. <laughs> That's brilliant, isn't it? It's a good, good show of hands. He's also, as we know, the director of the Shamima Begum story, a BBC documentary tracing Shamima's journey since 2014, which contains some of her, some of her account of what happened. And Tasneem Akunji, welcome. Thank you. Tasneem, can we put our hands up about anything? <laughs> yeah, we've seen, those of us who've seen the film have seen Tasneem <laughs> in the film. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Criminal defence lawyer. A solicitor working in the field of terrorism and terrorism-related offending. He's been engaged in this field of work within the context of legal defence from 1999. So you will have seen the change, the tightening up towards prevent, etc. In addition to his normal activities, in his role as a defence lawyer, he's also been involved in matters relating to the repatriation of, wait for this neologism, regrettees. People who regret what they have done in travelling to conflict zones. Uh, in a more direct and proactive capacity. I think that will come up this evening, asking you to give us a broader context for Shamima's um, plight in the media, etc. With respect to current UK counter-terrorism strategy, Tasneem has provided evidence to the Home Affairs Select Committee on the subject, as well as lecturing on the topic and engaging in panel debates, both in the UK and abroad. So, fantastic lineup. Thank you for coming. I will ask a few questions of each person. We'll get really brilliant answers, and then I will throw it open to the floor. I know what happens then is that your questions, which will be excellent, will trigger quite detailed responses. So we'll have a, a, a to and a fro, which I hope will be, will be really uh, effective and informative. So Josh, can we just ask you about the broader scale of your work on ISIS? Because it's been, you've been working on ISIS um, for years. Can you tell us why and a little bit about the context? Yeah, I mean, so I, as you will know, if you've listened to the podcast, probably came to the Shamima Begum story in an odd way. I was working in East London Mosque at the time, making a completely unrelated project at the moment that she went missing. So I sort of found myself front and centre to it. And as Taz will be able to tell you, the mosque became this sort of focal point uh, for the community, for Shamima's family and indeed for the authorities to some degree. So I was sort of there observing all this happened and followed Shamima Begum's story for a while. And then, you know, Shamima disappeared essentially for four years. And in that point, I sort of started to specialise in terrorism and people that we would class as radicals. And it sort of just spiralled from there. And that has seen me work an awful lot in places like Iraq and Syria, but also in the UK as well. And so the next question about which follows on from that is, can you tell us a little bit about the process of making the documentary? Because you did uncover stuff I didn't know, like the guy, Mohammed, who was the, the trafficker. This is something, yeah, I want to come back to that later because he, to me, he's the central figure. It's not Shamima at all. Mm. It's something like that being facilitated by the Canadian government. Anyway, I mustn't get ahead of myself. Um, <laughs> so making the documentary, and so that particularly this documentary and the obstacles and the dangers you faced. Obstacles and dangers. I mean, first of all, we're taking on as I think you would all agree, one of the most contentious stories in Britain today. So just from a storytelling perspective, everyone has an opinion. So that is tough. Uh, and then obviously you have a story that has been given 
a lot of media coverage. I think that, I don't mean to sound cliched here, but I think we often find, and Sarah, my producer, fellow investigative producer, sat in the front row here and is around for questions afterwards. But both of us felt it was like, wow, so much has been said about this, but so little is really known about what happened. And so, you know, there's that about how do you make it different. And then along the way, you know, we encountered organised crime gangs, we encountered members of various security services, we encountered members of ISIS, and there are all the threats and risks that come with that that you have to plan around. I think one of the uh, key things that for us allowed us to break through and do something different was simply that Shamima Begum decided for the first time to give what she says was her full account of everything that happened, which was a unique starting point. So that sort of set us on our journey. And uh, uh, following on from that, do you, were there risks to Shamima in becoming involved with you and your, the process of making the documentary? Yeah, so I mean, it's actually quite sad and, you know, you can believe me or, or not believe me, but... So just a bit of context quickly, and I'll get to my point. But I used to work in the NGO sector before I was a journalist. And when you do interviews of, say, survivors of sexual violence or things like that, there's quite a rigorous consent process, as I'm sure you would imagine, that you go through. And I sort of brought similar things of that into my consent process when working as a journalist. So the first time I met Shamima, um, she and I, she was aware of me a bit because of my previous work, but we sort of sat down, and she wanted to do an interview and in the first instance, I genuinely said, but hold on, let's not do that yet. And I talked her through the process of consent, the process of what that would involve and what that would look like. And she sort of revealed that was the first time that that had ever happened, that she felt that she had consented to an interview before, which I thought was quite sad. But it sort of set the, the tone for us to be able to get a lot more from her than I think others have previously. Brilliant. Um, could I bring Tasneem in now and ask you both the same question? which is about her comments, um, which were quite tactful, about how she felt that she didn't really belong in this country, and whether, that, whether you think that influenced her, the environment she grew up in, where it is possible to make um, a Muslim feel unwelcome. We know there are lots of devices for doing that. Tasneem, how, how do you think that did... Was it, or was it just that Shamina told such a good story about, let's go... No, I mean, we mustn't forget what we share the air with Nigel Farage. <laughs> and he does make it his business to create an extra hostile environment from outside of, uh, let's say, centre politics, where we had Theresa May and Sajra Javed and the others going out of their way to use the legal structures and mechanisms that they have at their disposal to create a hostile environment. And since 9-11, it's no surprise to anybody that uh, the prevent strategy which is also targeted through education, schools, as well as you know, doctors as well, um, has, has again created an extra layer of hostility. So it's no surprise that Shamim Begum was simply articulating something that that particular community in this country has felt for some time. I mean, completely, I would point to episode four of the podcast where we get into the sort of why and how did this happen. I think we often forget the environment of 2015 and the environment of that community. You know, that was the time when Taz and I first became friends in, in 2015. He initially hated me when he first met me. Um, <laughs> we, we got over that. Um, <laughs> hopefully. Um, but, you know, you have to remember this was a time where, you know, Paul Golding from Britain First was running into mosques and driving around East London in an armoured Land Rover and, you know, generating hate. He, ironically, he was convicted on a terrorism charge himself. So it was a very hostile environment. Now, what Shamima Begum talks about is, you know, you have to remember that she is, in essence, a second-generation migrant to this country. And that puts you in her words, in quite a difficult position, right? Because you have the desire to fulfil what your parents or the older generation believe is the right way to be. But then as a younger person, you also have a, a challenge of fitting in with perhaps a more liberal or, or, or different way of sort of London, a very free-thinking society, very, you know, more... So it's, it creates an identity crisis. Throw in her best friend, a lady called Charmina, leaving to join ISIS before her... <laughs> and that sort of radical ideology being pushed to her through Sharmina. ISIS were very effective at tapping into people that were perhaps facing an identity crisis, in part because of issues that arise with migration, but also in part with how this country treats migrants. So when you met her, did you think she was a threat to the country? Um, 
I think you, you have to broaden that. So, in principle, anybody who's been with ISIS, it is fair to say we have to consider they could pose a threat. Was the girl in front of me at that time a threat? Absolutely not. Um, but I think, you know, when we get into this narrative of is Shamima Begum a threat or not, I think we, we start to reduce, it becomes a sort of too focused a narrative. In essence, if we're talking about the notion of Shamima as a threat, we have to look at it in a much broader context, which is what is the threat of leaving people like Shamima in Syria? What is the long-term risks that are associated with that? You know, we have tens of thousands of people from more than 56 nations in makeshift detention facilities in northeastern Syria. It's Guantanamo Bay 2.0, except this time we've got kids there. Some of them are born in these camps. Some of them have only ever known the world of this camp. Now, if you think about that from a de-radicalisation perspective, you know, de-radicalisation relies upon finding common ground with the person in front of you. If you have a child that has grown up in a camp surrounded by the ideology of ISIS, the only people around that camp are oppressors. It becomes very hard then you obviously have the risks of bringing these people home. That is, you know, there are threats there. You have to be, you can't, you can't ignore that. But it's a balance. And fundamentally, I think we can all agree that everyone deserves the right to a fair trial and right to have their civil liberties afforded to them. Yeah, absolutely. No, the reason I asked whether you thought she was a threat was because of what Sajid Javid had said. That was the, that's the framing, that's the national framing. Totally, and if I give you a shorter answer, I've spent 10 years talking to members of terrorist groups and Shamima Begum is a fairly shit jihadist in terms of the scale. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My producer is massively unimpressed with that answer. Brilliant. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Tasneem a couple, of questions, couple more questions, if I may, and then open it to the floor, so we'll go backwards and forwards. Um, Tasneem, two things. One is... From, your, from the legal perspective, whose responsibility do you think Shamima Begum is? And the other question, which is related to that, but obviously it's much more um, emotive, is tell us, if you will, a little bit about what it was like, what the problems were in t taking on this and working with her family. Sure. Um, I mean, the phrase human fly tipping comes to mind when it, com when it comes to the issue of whose responsibility is this. And the reason for that is Shamim Begum was born in the UK. Um, she was she was schooled in the UK. She was radicalised in the UK. She used pounds to travel from London over to, to Syria. And she used a British passport. She's never been to Bangladesh. And the only possible countries that can be responsible for her are whatever the sort of sort of the, the situation is that part of Syria is under a under a uh, sort of breakaway. A rebel group that jurisdiction uh, may have some ability to try her or Bangladesh as her parents home country or the UK but in terms of nexus and where the responsibility lies where all of this genesis happened it was definitely here um, if there was any crimes in terms of going over to join a terrorist organization that fell squarely within the UK criminal law here before she left and what she's done out there or not done out there is a matter of that requires examination through evidence and that evidence being tested in a court. Now that court doesn't exist in Syria and uh, Bangladesh has no jurisdiction for that court and it's only the UK courts that could really uh, leave themselves open to allow that to happen. And it's funny that at the time when the UK government is spending treasure and energy and telling lies actually in terms of stopping Shamima, uh, a young girl, coming back to the UK to face justice. At exactly that same moment and throughout that entire time, the UK government was looking for the brother of the bomber of the Ariana Grande concert in Manchester and spreading treasure, spending treasure and effort to locate him, secure him, and then bring him back to the UK to face trial. So you have the, and he was, on any metric, far more dangerous than Shamima and Begum could be. So when you have these two things happening in parallel, it's an entire contradiction. Yeah, that's a very good analogy. Very good analogy. Thank you very much. And so the second question was, um, what are the challenges you faced in working with Shamia Begum's family and representing her or s and supporting them? No challenges? Oh, it doesn't make you popular. I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, so, so we had death threats, some of which were credible, uh, at the office and at my home. You have uh, something that's even more odious than that, which is uh, journalists from the Daily Mail um, 
<coughs> and uh, and that that tends to uh, you know leave a bit of a negative taste. You then get the uh, sort of the uh, the far right wing of the country forming views about you and populating your social media posts. And even though they've never been clients of our law firm, they apparently decided to leave Google reviews as well, <laughs> claiming various things. <laughs> so so not not very nice. Could, do you mind if I add something? Because I uh, find myself in the unique perspective of spending a lot of time with Taz in the UK, Turkey. Um, and I witnessed, there was a period where one of Shamima Begum's friends could have potentially been brought back uh, from, from Syria. And Taz and uh, somebody else called Salman, who was then head of uh, East London Mosques Communication, I witnessed those two, through great self-sacrifice, do everything in their power to try to make that happen. You know, Salman had just had his first child and spent weeks, if not months, not really seeing that child. And Taz and I would meet in car parks in the middle of the night, not like that. But, like, <laughs> because Taz would be through all hours of the day trying to find a way to make this happen and got very close and that it, to see how that really took its toll on not only you and your family I think you know you did just play it down a little bit how much personal suffering you went through in 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 order to for free try and save one if not multiple girls lives and I think you should be commended for that because you and Salman did try very hard well that's kind of I think most most people who looked into the eyes of a mother who's lost that child and made a promise that they will do everything that they can do to bring that child back would probably do the same thing. And I'm lucky enough to have a family who backed me in that. Many, many wouldn't. And many of them, you know, they suffered greatly as well, uh, personally. But uh, we can't really, really go into that. But, um, you know, it's, it takes, they say it takes a tribe to raise a child, but it takes an entire country to fight its own government. And we're still fighting. One more question then, one more question to Tasneem and then open it to the floor and we can develop some questioning from you guys. Um, can you tell us about this process of revoking a person's citizenship and, you know, in what circumstances would this normally occur and, obviously, I think I know the answer to this, Do, you know, was it legal? Was it, was, it, was it a legally acceptable act to revoke a citizenship? So three questions, really. Sure. I mean, is, that, is this a PG... Do I have to adhere to PG rules before 9 o'clock watershed, or can I just get into experience? might have to filter a little bit, mate. Right, OK. Uh, it's being recorded. Oh, is it? OK. In, yeah. <laughs> but you're, feel, please feel free. Well, you insert your own bleeps uh, at, at will. But, I mean, the thing is that the, 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 the British Nationality Act is a widely drafted document. Um, it allows the Home Secretary to revoke the citizenship of somebody as long as it doesn't leave them stateless. That's a, an interesting thing to consider. But, but it only, it, it does so with a very, very light test, which is that the person is not conducive to the public good. Now, I think all of us here have been in the lifts here, and if somebody farts in the lift, that's not conducive to the public good. <laughs> but that would actually, uh, you know, that would meet the test effectively. Um, and so, Prior to the events of Sergeant Javed and others, um, this particular legislation was known and recognised as being uh, controversial. Uh, we had, I think, uh, David Anderson QC, uh, Casey, who at the time was in the Independent Review of Terrorism, I think back in 2008. No, Lord Anderson. Lord Anderson, yeah. He was involved in Brexit as well. Not quite. Quite naughty of him, actually. But, um, <laughs> um, but he, he was generally a very fair man. And he went out of his way to uh, comment on this part of immigration law, even though it didn't fall within his purview at the time, and uh, raised it as a concern because it is so intrusive on, on someone's life, the effect it has to leave somebody in another country without recourse to coming back to their home is possibly one of the most intrusive things that can happen to a person. And he opinioned that it would have been better and would be better if the law were changed so that a Home Secretary, if they have these concerns, could refer the person to a judge to have the evidence reviewed and for the judge to make a decision in light of the current laws about whether someone's citizenship should be taken away or not. Um, that is the mechanism we use for TPIM orders uh, and the old route uh, control orders, where a judge would have to make that decision by a referral. 
But when somebody's out of the country, which is even worse, it's the Home Secretary who directly sort of does these things. So Sajid Javed basically got out of his bed one day, thought, I want to be leader of the Conservative Party. How do I do this? There's some, some girl abroad that I can really rag on. And then, uh, and then he sort of stripped her of citizenship and thought, that's a really good idea. Um, and uh, that's what I think happened, frankly. But it was literally a, uh, a, a mechanism to bolster his, his leadership or uh, potential in the Conservative Party. But on, on a wider note, these laws were only used in the single digits per year before this. So two or three people, nine people, I think it was at the most in any one year, who had their citizenship revoked. And though, those sort of people, the accusations about them or the intelligence around them, well, they were on a sort of Guy Fawkes level danger, you know, um, according to the, uh, the, the, Home, the Home Secretary's evidence. But after the Shamima Begum and that in the year coming up to that, these went up to 100 people were getting stripped. Uh, I think the figure's now nearly 300 who have been stripped. And we're not just talking about the individuals themselves. It is the children that they have with them that have no ability to return to safety or their families. And uh, the children far outnumber the individuals themselves. So this is the policy we have at the moment. It is you know, born out of a right-wing hatred, uh, and it, it is turning us into monsters. Do you mind if I just add one thing? Yes. I would, you know, the judgment on Shamima Begum's recent hearing is available online, and I'd urge you to read it because it's quite interesting. You know, the top line is what you've seen, that, you know, Shamima Begum can't come back, she can't have her citizenship back. But when you get into it, it's quite intriguing. You know, there is language in there used by the judge that uh, there are missed opportunities, which we can talk about. There's the Canadian, there's also others, to prevent her from going. The judge uses language like, it's myopic. You know, there are questions about whether the state did all it could to protect her. There are... The judge in that judgment expresses a sort of limitation of his power. So, yes, in the one hand, it is legal, but there are other things to be explored, and in, you could interpret, and some people do, that he's left it open for an appeal in various other realms of the court, be that misconduct in a public office or European Court of Rights. So it isn't as clear-cut as a lot of the headlines made out. Very good point. So what we're facing here really is thinking about what the philosopher Agamben calls the state of exception, where a state that wishes to um, bolster its reputation with its own voters creates the sense of danger. And so we've got a, a perfect scenario, unfortunately. And I think that it's important that you guys are here today because this, this could possibly change. As, as, as Josh said, there could be some kind of, I, I, I think if, if, you, if you showed Shamima Begum as she is now, she's not 15 anymore, she's, she's much more uh, wise about her 15-year-old self than she was then. And uh, I think she's great. I'd love her. I'd love her back. Um, what I'm I suppose there's a flip side to that coin, in fairness, right? And this is setting aside my personal opinion, but I think it's something we always have to consider when we talk about Shamima Begum's debate, in fairness. There is no doubt she was 15 when she left, and that needs to be considered. But we have to be also considerate to the fact of the group that she joined, right? A group that committed genocide. If you're a Yazidi survivor of that genocide. How do you feel about Shamim and Begum and the people like her? So I think it's always important to try to understand the wider context that Shamim and Begum sits in and to understand the people you disagree with, in essence, and what they're driving at. And that, I think, is how you get to a greater truth of the Shamim and Begum story. Well, I'd like to jump in there for a moment. Um, if I yeah, say. here we go. Right. Hotting up. Hotting up. You go, then me. Well, I'll say <laughs> that the, the issue of Shamim and Begum is nothing to do with Shamim and Begum. It's to do, it's to do with us who we are as a people. And if you say you are people who believe in the rule of law and fairness, well, that doesn't mean anything when you're judging your friends by those standards. It never has. It's when you judge your enemies and the people you don't like uh, and what standards you apply to them, that's when it has meaning. And I think that's the important focus on that. It's not who is Shamima Begum, it's who are we, how fair are we, and how just are we. I completely agree with that, and I think this is no longer a story about a 15-year-old girl. If you think Shamima Begum's story has come to encompass issues of migration, race, religion, 
British identity, how we want to be, how we want to treat you know, issues of security. There is so much wrapped up in this that everyone can see something new that we've got very far away from processing it as an individual case. Yeah, and my bit now. I want to, I want go to on, go say, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I want to say is about this guy, Mohammed... Uh, Rashid. Mohammed Rashid, who was, if you remember him from the film, those of you who've seen it, he was the expert uh, people smuggler who took maybe up to 140 people... Yeah, potentially the around there. I mean, if he'd stood in Istanbul or wherever and said to the girls, girls, you're only 15, I'm going to send you home, then he wouldn't have had the capacity to create this enemy. He facilitated, this is my view, and you can say I'm extreme here, but it seems to me that he is the key. Somebody like him, he was a Canadian operative. Yeah, I mean, can I... So this is an interesting concept. So what we're talking about now is um, missed opportunities. The times that this all, none of us would be in this room. That begins, in essence, in December 4th, 2014, when, around about there, when her best friend, Sharmina, leaves the country, ends up with ISIS. The authorities are aware where she is, that she's gone. A school report, again, this is, you can read it within the judgment, uh, highlights that Shamima Begum is potentially at risk at joining her. And the police say, no, she's not, don't worry about it. And so... Point one, there is, in my view, some serious questions that need to be asked of the authorities in this country about what was going on there. Was intelligence prioritised over safeguarding? So that is potentially first option to stop this, which is what the judge described as myopic. Point two, we spent a lot of time in Turkey uh, looking at this guy, Mohammed Rashid. This is the man who facilitated Shamima Begum and her friends travel from Istanbul bus station to the border of Syria. Now, we obtained hundreds of pages of secretive information about this man, what he was up to. We've broadcast a fraction of it. And he, in essence, was recruited in Jordan uh, to become a Canadian asset, a Canadian spy, if you will. It looks like he was given the promise of resettlement to Canada as a reward for that. And he went back to Raqqa, Syria, which is where he's from, and started spying on ISIS. Eventually, he ended up in Turkey. He was seemingly quite effective in the intelligence he was gathering. Uh, what's not in the film and the podcast, it looks like he was working very effectively inside Syria, identifying British jihadists, uh, people potentially around Jihadi John, were in his sphere of influence. So he was, you know, he's a real intelligence catch. Where it starts to go wrong is the people running that operation, uh, the two people running that operation are friends of somebody I know, it turns out, and they were not experienced. And it sort of got out of hand, and it sort of looks like, I don't know this to be true, but this has been what's been speculated to me, that for the Canadian intelligence apparatus... This man was a great get. It was allowing them to go to the Americans, to the Brits, to help feed intelligence, to show off what they could do, which is normally beyond the remit. And a former Canadian intelligence officer, as you will have seen in the film and in the intro, has said that had his handlers acted differently, had they followed standard operating procedures, the rules that they have, Shamima Begum would never have made it to Syria. Now, there is a question about where is Canada's accountability in this as well. Thank you very much. Do you want to say, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, that, that failure at the early outset of pol failure of policing, allowing the girls to go, that's an ongoing failure. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is because there's always been and continues to be the opportunity for there to be a serious case review so that, so that our country and the borough as well can learn what took place at that point, learn from that, and then implement safeguarding measures um, in terms of the lessons learned. Now, not only has that not been done, we have asked, and many people have asked, Tower Hamlets under John Biggs when he was the mayor, and currently under Dr. Rahman, to engage in that process, to actively engage in that, and we have always been rebuffed. So it's not just myopic in terms of, you know, Mr. Magoo can't see through his uh, thick glasses. It's an active turnaround yeah. to not look in that direction by purpose. And I think that's the bit that's entirely unacceptable. And with Mohammed Rashid, you know, he's moved over 130 people to join a deadly terrorist organization. And that's appreciably more people than have watched Josh Baker's documentaries. <laughs> Can you see why I want Taz to delete Twitter? 
What I would say, so can I just say, there are interesting games that you see as well uh, going on in the media, I mean, obviously, but one of the former uh, police officers who was in Terrorism Command potentially has some problematic issues around decisions that he made, potentially I use for legal reasons. And he is, you know, he is the one that came out and started highlighting, oh, the Canadians came and met us and what have you. And I think it's interesting how these narratives take hold in the media because he was doing that to benefit himself and to draw attention away from this first failing, which is the police failing that Taz is talking about. So why I bring this up is because when we talk about this being prevented, you have the authorities playing games and trying to create stories to distract from other failings that are going on. So you really need to look at this in the whole and sort of go a bit beyond the initial headlines that you see around these issues because there's a lot of politics in play internally. Interestingly as well, you know, one of the head of the Counterterrorism Command who managed Shamim Begum's uh, situation is now head of the Met. So it's a, it's a really interesting environment to take on this story. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that particular officer's name is Richard Walton. It's worth Googling. Um, <coughs> so With friends like this. So, well, you know, it's, it's not coming from you, but, but it's, it's, it's worth Googling his previous exploits, particularly with the Lawrence family and why he left the police. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask Tasneem if, if I give up... We've only got two microphones for the audience, so if I renounce, if I renounce mine, will you allow me to share your...? Of course, so I'm going to, do you have the lights up for this? Um, I'm hoping, you, I know that you're going to ask such brilliant questions that we'll get full and detailed responses from these guys. I always used to joke that Taz lived off a diet of Red Bull and cigarettes, so I sort of <laughs> brought him one for tonight. Aww. So Thank we've you. got two mics, one there, and one there. If you could raise your hand, please, because we'd like this one down here and one over there, please. Could we have... Three, yep, yeah. so we'll do one, two, three. If I could ask, yeah, so can you take the, take, in a minute, we've only got two mics. <laughs> um, so can you, are you happy to take three questions? Can you hand three questions at a go? I can try. Yeah. <laughs> so first one, please. Uh, this question for Josh. Was it a challenge to remain impartial, given your own views about the case? Uh, do you want me to answer or wait? Sorry. See me as a Labrador. Do you want me to speak now or wait for the other can two? Can hang on? I can. Yeah, my question's very similar to that as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, first of all, it's a brilliant podcast. I absolutely loved it. Thank you um, very much. And recommended it to all my friends. What, I've, what I thought the strength of the podcast was that it was so even-handed, um, you know, even to the point that you gave uh, Shamima the final word in the podcast, which I just thought was brilliant. Um, so it's a similar question in terms of, you know, that's the strength for me of the podcast, and it you can anybody could listen to that podcast throughout. You know, a white man in a van, anybody out on the street could listen to that podcast because it doesn't present judgments. It's just so incredibly even-handed. So yeah, it was just it was. You know, but uh, yeah, that's what I think. Um, so I was just wondering how hard you worked on trying a similar question, not to be judgmental, try to just present the facts as they were, and you know, not take a not take a side, but just be. Um, leave it to the audience to make their own decision about the whole case. Thank you very much. Third uh, this one's aimed for both uh, Taz and Josh. Uh, do you think that the umbrage on Shamina Begum's uh, case is more focused on the climate around the case rather than with Begum herself? Because there were a lot of young young girls and uh, young people who were also in you know her same situation. They left they left Europe and not just in the UK but also uh, France, Germany, uh, Spain, wherever. And or even America and Canada, and we don't really see like as much of a big, uh, pr the exponential case made as we've seen with Begum. So do you think the umbrage is more focused on the climate around her case, or is it just more focused on Begum herself? Okay, thank you very much, Josh. First, would you like to go first? Um, so I think too often today, activism and journalism gets confused. They are separate things. My job is not to have an opinion, and I'm really glad uh, that this may surprise you that I actually did this with the BBC, um, because it mandates me not to. 
And with such a contentious story, you the best thing, and if you listen to series one of the podcast, it's a similar thing, so it's not just Shamim and Bagan, but I try very hard to make sure that my job is, in essence, to work my arse off to present the facts to you, tell you what I think in terms of what I know and what I don't know, but not to tell you my judgment and leave that to you. And that's kind of the beauty of why I like the way I do work is to, to do this and hand it to you because that is proper public service journalism and, and not to fall into the trap of activism. Um, and actually, just incidentally, you know, I mentioned the consent process I went through with Shumi and Beg, and what I said to her is, I'm not always going to agree with you, but I will always be fair. And I try very hard to always be fair. And, you know, on a personal level, friends of friends of mine had their heads cut off by this group. I'm full of shrapnel from this group. I've spent, most importantly, years sat with survivors of that genocide and what they've been through. And I was very cognizant of that while sat with Shamima and other members of the group, but I'm still going to be fair, and I'm still going to keep my judgment out of it, no matter how hard it is, and I think it's absolutely essential. What was the second one? It was, told you, Labrador. Um, it was about the noise. Do you want to go first? Countries, it was, well, you know, why is it really that we still have such a focus on her? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, look, I, think, I think hers is a relatively unique case in that before before she even landed in Syria, uh, her face was plastered all over the television and international news, and the, her other um, sort of co-travellers as well. Now that wasn't a decision made by lawyers; it was a decision made by the the UK Met Police. Really, that they thought that that was a good idea to do this. Now, that's a terrible idea. It's the worst idea in the world. Yeah, you know? because in these circumstances, when you have young people who are travelling. <coughs> You will often find that people who are responsible inside of the state apparatus, the police, security services, they may well, well want to be very helpful, and they will may well they may want to um, let's say interpret the rules that govern their behaviour in in a most humane way and stretch to to achieve the goal of getting those people back. But the minute you have cameras on you, thanks, Josh, um, then uh, that's not going to happen. They, they, they get rigidly stuck within a very conservative reading of the rules. And so whenever anyone's dealing with a sort of security apparatus, it's always, it's always twilight or darkness rather than uh, you know, the glaring cameras. So there's always a tension between journalism uh, and, and law, because in law you want to be very mindful of the, the facts that come out and the way they're presented. Whereas when someone sticks a camera, a camera in your face and just says talk, well, then, you know, that's why most lawyers are bald. We've torn our hair up by that point, really. Um, so, so there was that. It was already mega news before they went. But the feeling was that these are three silly girls who have made a mistake. Let's bring them back. Let's do our best to, do, to, to achieve that. But over the years, events happened. You had the Ariana Grande con concert. You know, we, we lost people in this country to ISIS. There was, you know, murders on bridges that took place. Um, and when people blow themselves up or get killed in the process of committing terrorism, there's a, I think there's a sort of debt that hangs in the air. Um, and Shamima Begum the, became the lightning rod for that debt to be paid. And Sajid Javed was the one that pointed the finger at her and said, this is the, this is the person to focus on for all of that negativity. Um, and so she is paying the price for the actions of others. Um, and we have tried to do our best to educate everyone to say, actually, that's not, that's not right and not fair. I agree with what Taz has said. I mean, I would point you, if you want to look at more of the sort of... There are two narratives, right, of Shamima Begum. There is the 15-year-old girl that, as Taz says, left, largely seen as a victim, somebody who's groomed. And then there is the Shamima Begum of 2019, who is seen as a threat must be stopped from coming back to the UK. And if you listen to episodes, I think it's eight and nine of the podcast, you'll get a sense of that second narrative being created in the media and how that comes about and the impact of that, right? And you have to start to question the mental state of Shamima Begum when she's talking in the way she's talking. You know, there are a lot of things that have contributed to creating this wider narrative that now exists and influences how we see her and the decisions that are made about her. And you saw that in court, right? Some of the things that are mentioned 
and were discussed stem from news stories. And some of the news stories, I can't go into what, but there are key allegations against Shamima Begum that Sarah and I and our other producer, Joe Kent, have spent a very long time getting to the bottom of, even finding journalists' sources. And I think it's fair to say that one or two of the allegations are absolutely outrageous that they were ever published. And that specific journalist has a lot to answer for. Sarah's biting her teeth. She's like, please don't go any further. Please don't go any further. So I could take, ask some more questions in a minute. I'd like three women in a minute, but just let me add a, a postscript to this, which is that um, when Theresa May was still Prime Minister um, was the time when Shamima had her third baby, I think. When was it? 2019, 2018? Yeah, March. And I was in number 10, I'd been asked, uh, and I naively agreed to, be, to make a briefing about um, Islam on campus and the way Prevent was having a negative impact and the chilling of speech, etc. And then after I'd done that visit, which wasn't very productive, um, I saw her on telly holding this limp bundle and I contacted the people I'd been speaking to and I said, I, you need to bring her home, I think that third baby is dead. And they said, uh, okay. They, I mean, it was, um, you know, brush off a fly. It, it, wasn't a, it wasn't part of the narrative that they were um, working on. So could we have three questions? Three more questions? Just in support of that, sorry, just on a <laughs> practical thing, 10 seconds. There is often an argument made that it wouldn't have been possible. We don't have consular services in Syria. There's an SAS base about 20 minutes from, or was at that time, I should say, from that camp. So had there been a desire, practically, it would have been enactable. So just to add to that, Jeremy Hunt at the time said that uh, it was too dangerous to send British uh, British uh, operatives to go there and even take to it. Jeremy Hunt said that. That's after we had BBC journalists interviewing her, you know, and a string of journalists said, I went there, you know, so... Uh, you know, the, the lies were palpable, and it's something that, you know, we wrote to, to Sajid Javed to say, OK, let's park Shamima Begum to the side for the moment. There's a baby here. That baby's British. And we will go and get the baby. Just don't stand in our way. Give us the travel documents for the child. Show us the... Pre no, nothing. So they, you know, as far as I'm concerned, they, they killed that baby. Five pregnancies and three babies that she lost. Um, question here, thank you for being so patient. And there's a lady there, and I want another lady, or a female, another female person. Is the one over there? Could we have you, please? Because I'm trying to be fair to the geography of the room as well. Um, so one, and then where was the second one? Two and three, please. Um, hi, firstly, yeah, I just wanted to say, Josh, it's an absolutely great podcast. I listened to the f first, I'm not a monster. I can't so see you, sorry. Oh, uh, that's here, uh, I'm here. Sorry, oh, yeah, sorry. You're, like, you're talking sorry. over there, and I'm like, where is she? What's going sorry, on? No. That, that's an um, investigative journalist, like, by the way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> where am I? What's happening? Sorry, um, so I've obviously listened to both the series, they're both remarkable or so, and I thought it was really interesting how you really hammered home the 15-year-old Shamima Begum being questioned and then getting her to reflect and remorse on that, because I think that's really useful for anyone to listen to that, to be able to, like it was very apparent for me as a listener to be able to make up my own mind about it. But I suppose what I just wanted to know, like whenever, obviously you were in the camp interviewing her, how did it feel leaving her behind and also right now do you think she's obviously probably, probably a stupid question but do you feel she's she's in danger right now and obviously if something happens that's my, I came away from listening to that podcast thinking like if something happens to her it's the blood on the UK government's hands or so but how, how did it feel like leaving her behind after after doing that um in uh, those series of interviews or so I realise also I ducked your question earlier about her safety and you've just brought it back up. That wasn't intentional. I will answer that in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Number two, please. Thank you. Um, Hi, sorry, I'm a bit starstruck because the, the podcast has been a highlight of... Um, I'm really a moron, so you're very kind. 
Now, so the question I wanted to ask actually relates a little bit to safety. I'm um, a part of an, a research network at the Illinois School of Economics that has uh, studied for many years the consequences of um, the life of former child soldiers in Uganda when abducted by the Lord Resistance Army. And what we found many times was that just by the fact of talking to us, very often they were somehow putting themselves in danger, in danger after having been reintegrated. So talking to us actually had very deep consequences on their life in the community that they are. And uh, I was wondering, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that and uh, how, how she doing, how Shamima doing now. Thank you very much. And lady over here, you got her, got the camera Yeah, on. hi. Um, no, no, I'm the one behind actually, but she's oh. there, sorry. Why is she the one with the microphone? <laughs> okay, carry on. Sorry. Um, first of all, I'd like to say I love your. Oh, sorry. Uh, I love the podcast. I'm Thank a huge you. fan. And my question concerns um, a little bit of a comparison between the first uh, series and the second series of the podcast. Uh, I couldn't help when I was listening to the story of Shamima Begin um, comparing her case to that of Samantha and Matthew in the U.S. and how different um, they both concluded. Of course, Samantha is now serving time in prison in the U U.S., and her son and her children are alive and well with her family. And it's completely different for Shamima Begum. What do you think are the key differences in the American and the U.K. approach to dealing with these people who have gone to Syria? And do you think there are any lessons the U.K. could have learned from the U.S.'s approach? I mean, I also know that... Um, Samantha was being investigated for crimes related to her, the criminal activity of her husband. Um, but yeah, that was just my question. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask both of our distinguished panelists to answer these the questions about safety and danger because it applies to both of your relationships. Do you want to start, Taz? I mean, I mean, theoretically, the safety danger balance is meant to sit with the Home Secretary. But we, we've sort of seen how that's um, arguably gone wrong. And, and it's always a problem when you have a politician whose who's primary concern is himself, then it's his party, and generally, you know, if, if that's the hat he's wearing whilst not wearing the hat of a fair uh, official, um, then we're, go we're going to get things wrong. And I think we've seen that in politics quite a lot, and particularly in Shamima Begum's case, which is why I don't think that question should ever be in the hands of a politician. It should always be in the hands of a judge who looks at the evidence. And we, we have all been denied the evidence. We've been, we've been sold a kipper um, by leaks coming out of the home, home office about suicide vests and sewing and things. And these are, you know, there's been no supporting evidence of that. And neither have these issues been raised in the SIAC proceedings. Um, but they found their way into the Daily Mail. So, you know, th this is an incredibly good example of manipulation and manipulation for a result. So it almost doesn't matter what the risk she poses is or isn't when it is expedient for a, uh, a politician to raise an issue, a spectre, and have that spectre dealt with. So do I think, do I think these risks can be managed? Yes, of course I think they can be managed. They are being managed. Uh, we have one of the most incredibly mature security service apparatus in the world. Uh, that we have a mature police force, albeit somewhat depleted. Um, the idea that the arrayed powers of the Metropolitan Police, MI5, MI6, and potentially military intelligence, GCHQ, can't deal with a 23-year-old woman who's failed to actually raise three kids is actually a testament against what our politicians think of our own abilities. Thank you very much. Josh? So the series one and then i'll work my way back to safety so just I, I don't know how many of you listened to series one but very briefly follows an american family end up at the heart of the isis caliphate she says she's tricked what's the truth um and the difference is, is sam does go home her kids go home sam is prosecuted now that's indicative of a u.s policy that sort of comes in a bit after sam sam was a very early person into those camps those camps weren't in the media yet uh the Americans for a long time have been advocating for people to take their citizens or former citizens home. Actually, Donald Trump, believe it or not, was a massive advocate of that and one of the biggest voices in that. And we are 
I had a meeting at the Council of Europe about 18 months ago, and it, there was a move then for European nations to start to move towards repatriation. We've seen a lot more of that. I think the difference is in this country is that issues of migration, issues of security, issues of religion to some degree are very hot topics for this government. And I think we can all see potentially the mood music and how that's being used and towards a coming election. And I think we're in a very different place politically compared to a lot of nations. You know, Australia previously had a very similar policy to us of leaving their citizens there. They had a change of government. They then had started repatriation. Interestingly, when they started bringing people back, there was public backlash and it sort of slowed down. But largely the mood music is at the moment that other nations are bringing their citizens back or starting to more so than Britain. Britain is becoming increasingly isolated in that. In terms of security, obviously we talked about threat assessment of uh, how you perceive Shamima. There is, you know, anyone who's been with ISIS, you cannot deny, could pose a threat. But there are scales of threat, mitigations put in place. As Taz rightly points out, we have an excellent security apparatus in this country. There is also another side, though, which is what you're talking about, which is how do I do my job, right? So when we talk about consent again, just because you say, yes, I will do an interview with you, Josh Baker, doesn't mean I immediately take that as consent. I have to then go away, or I have to have done previously, an assessment as to whether, A, you're able to consent, and B, what are the risks that you may not be cognizant of? One of the most stressful things about my job, which might seem odd, is that I have security call for the team on the ground. So ultimately, I'm responsible for Sarah's safety. Everyone's there. It comes on my head. And our contributors are an extension of that. So we had to do a big assessment around, are we putting Shamima at risk? What are those risks? Can we mitigate them? Can we put measures in place to do that? I can't talk about all of them publicly, but we did do some mitigations. Um, and we had to also assess whether Shamima could genuinely give informed consent. Um, and so all of those things are processes that we go through quite substantially, depending on who the person is, and we do a lot of work on it. Not every journalist does that, not every documentary maker does that. It's something that's very ingrained in, in my team when we work together, is that we obtain informed consent and we don't put people at risk, and we spend a lot of time mitigating. It doesn't always work, but for the most part it does. Taking it back here for a minute, and then we'll come back out to you guys. Um, can I ask you both, would Shamima have been treated differently if she were white? Yes. Well, not if she was Irish. <laughs> so, but, but, yeah. Red hair, yeah, maybe. I mean, at, at the same time that this question was going on um, with Shamima Begum, so journalists were asking this question, you know, is this racism? And, and they fairly were asking this question because you had a fellow called Jack Letts, who was a fighter who was out there, a British-Canadian citizen, and he hadn't had his citizenship stripped. Um, and actually, a number of journalists asked me to make a comment about that, and I refused to. And the reason I refused is because I didn't want to add to Jack Letts's problems, because had it then been highlighted in the news, then the government would have been forced to strip him. And that's exactly what happened in the end. Um, but yeah, there was that actual comparator at the time right there to be seen. So a longer answer to just yes. I think I'd just that as well. It's, it's very hard to quantify how much religion and race and ethnic background, uh, financial background plays a part in this, but it certainly does. You cannot ignore the fact that it will have a bearing, not only on legally how she's viewed, the authorities view her, but also how the media view her, right? All of those things play out day to day in our society. And, you know, Sarah is Jordanian. Even she has a different day to day experience operating in this society. So if you magnify that, I just pointed to an empty chair and I realised you're up there. Um, so, yes, these things do play a part, absolutely. Can I just ask you both to go back to the question you, you, you raised a little bit to do with other, other nations? We bec we're becoming more isolationist. Certain European nations are making more of an effort. Could, could you both comment on whether you have a sense of whether the other, other nations are managing that well? Are they, are they providing good support? How's it going? The Netherlands seem to be doing a, a good job. 
um, France reasonably. I mean, look, this is not an easy task. We shouldn't convince ourselves that it's as simple as just bringing people back. You have to have processes in place. Uh, there are ways that you can do this, though, right? People have been members of a prescribed terrorist organisation, so if you need to find a reason to detain somebody for safety, there are me measures to do that. We find reasons to detain people through stop and search and far lesser things all the time in this country, so it's not a difficult thing to do. And the Americans, by the way, do this all the time with terrorist suspects. They use something called a Title 18 1001 charge, and what that is is lying to an FBI officer. So they interview you, they find a discrepancy in your story, they detain you on a 1001 charge, and then they build a case against you. There is ample legal room to be able to detain people if you want to. Yeah, I don't advocate the abuse of uh, state powers in that way, but um, <laughs> but, but we, 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 we have TPIM orders which are, which are limited to two years, but that, it's not a criminal sanction. It's a civil order that basically places somebody under house arrest and under some extreme sort of... Uh, interventions about the, uh, the the telecommunications devices they can have, where they live, the fact that they're monitored for a p period of time, and I, any, anyone who's been to a war zone, stayed there and been seeped in the dangers and the ideologies that are there, certainly needs to be assessed as to how well they can or can't integrate into society and how dangerous they may or may not be, even to themselves, um, and that teep in mechanism has been used as a tool of oppression in the past, but it can be used as a tool of monitoring, and certainly would give two years, uh, and it can be extended in order to monitor somebody and bring the right sort of um, professionals to bear so that they can be properly assessed, these people. And, and if there is problems there, then the evidence can be gotten. The idea that we don't have the evidence to prosecute people is frankly a nonsense. Uh, we, we have seen the use of evidence shared across jurisdictions in, uh, you know, from Europe um, in order to help gather the requisite evidence to, to, to bring terrorism prosecutions. So, so I, I think that we have the apparatus to assess people and manage them. And if, if they're that dangerous, then we have the legal means to lock them up if they've committed offences. To give you a practical example, doing a bit of open source research and working out which councils were building with a certain type of brick in London, we were able to find somebody that I know to be problematic within ISIS, who is eight miles from here in a house in West London, back and living. So there is precedent for bringing people back. Obviously, I have to say this, people who've been with ISIS pose a threat, but there is precedent. Oh, is that about bricks? It's how we found them. So particularly we knew the outlook of a house and we basically knew that there were a certain type of brick and we worked out that only a certain number of councils are built with that brick and so on and so forth. So it's the breadcrumbs of how we did it. It took a couple of hours of learning about brickwork, but it, um, it led us to a, a member of ISIS, former member of ISIS. You can tell that story is fictitious because that would mean that a council had built property in there. <laughs> You get 10 points. That was good. <laughs> I like that. Brilliant. Um, we've got uh, about 25 minutes left, so if you have a question, please please ask your question now. Lady here in orange, um, uh, right at the very back, a lady. Let's have a gentleman. I've got a gentleman. Can we do this lady here? Because Sarah's pointing at her. So. Okay, okay, okay. Yep, third. So, first... Uh, did I say that one? Oh, I'm getting confused now. Um, hi. <laughs> Hello. Um, thanks so much. Just here. Orange. Thanks. Sorry. Really. <laughs> no, it's blind. Fine. She did say orange. Yeah, flare um, gun. <laughs> small fire. Um, well, thanks so much for giving this talk. Really sorry, I haven't actually seen the documentary or listened to the podcast, oh, but right, I'm sure it's great. Um, for coming. <laughs> It's not a prerequisite, but thank you. I don't know, it felt like it. But um, <laughs> So I kind of wanted to ask a little bit more about the framework of regrettees and how you feel about um, the state of regret or the emotion of regret being this definitive um, 
thing for the people who are still out there or people who are now thinking of coming back um, is not necessarily something I've heard of and would love to hear a little bit more. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the prognosis. I'm right at the back, sorry. Thanks um, again for the wave. Yeah, it. hi. Um, I wanted to ask about the prognosis in this case. Um, have all the illegal avenues been exhausted? Is there a possibility of further appeals? Um, and also from a political point of view, you know, there's an election in this country next year. If we get a Labour government in, new Home Secretary, new, you know, political outlook, could things change? What's the legal avenue for that? And do you see any political appetite? Do you think that that is something that is likely to happen? Thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah. I might have got two, two short Hi. questions. One is, when you were making the documentary and then you found out all of the stuff, that all of the things from Shamima, was there anything that the BBC was saying that you shouldn't publish? Were you, were you restricted in any way? Um, I don't know if you couldn't even answer that now. But. Of course I'll answer. <laughs> and then the second question is, um, if she did come back, the repercussions that would happen in this country from the right-wing parties, using it to manipulate like how we even react to refugees coming to this country now, it, like what you were saying about tit for tat with debt hanging over her head, about people that have like yeah killed other people like on the bridge and she's got the consequence of that that now is going to be even more extreme if she comes back and then that can be used by the politicians to, to do other policies do you know what i mean to mm -hmm. maintaining the status quo is an interesting yeah uh can i start here and work my way back um so your first question was in essence about censorship so uh no uh I mean, people giggle at me in the BBC when I say I'm going to do something that's not meant to be arrogant, but I'm quite hard to control, as Sarah will attest. And, and to be fair, the mandate was just tell this fairly. We did omit some things, though. Uh, they relate to protecting the identity of other individuals. Um, there were some things that we took out of the last episode at the very last minute because we thought, actually, we're going to step over a line here and it's not fair. Um, so the public good versus protecting people changed. Uh, and then also there were additional things that I put in about the media where I was confronted basically and said, you can have it in, but we're going to get into a legal battle with X broadcaster who are going to come at us for slander. It's going to delay this. Do we want to do this or do we want to edit it in a certain way? So there were those sort of considerations, but there was nothing stopping. The other thing that was very odd about this is we were dealing with a lot of highly sensitive information relating to intelligence operations. And so we found ourselves in a bizarre situation. It's the only time I've really ever had this happen where I was not able to tell my bosses some of the stuff that we were aware of through the risk of making them a witness or culpable in something. So literally it was, at times, myself, my producer Joe and Sarah, who were the only one who were truly aware of certain things, to limit that pool. So, but there was no censorship, but there were editorial considerations that we put in place. What were the other questions? It was about, are there other legal avenues? Uh, so, I mean, Taz is a better place for this, but there are certainly infinite potential grounds for appeal and legal avenues. Well, there wouldn't be infinite, but th no, there are... Ask her current lawyer. Yeah, no, no, um, I mean, there are, there are appeal considerations that are being um, sort of formulated at the moment. Um, I, I'm told by her legal team, I'm a family's lawyer, but her legal team are pursuing those avenues. Uh, the difficulty is here that uh, in terms of instruction, there's very little communication between Shami and Begum and her own lawyers, and that was actually one of the bases of, uh, of an appeal that was successful in the um, in the Court of Appeal, but then overturned by the Supreme Court. And so until those are bottomed out, that's when a Court of Appeal, uh, the, the Court of Appeal will be engaged. The, but there are, you know, there are also considerations in terms of government and outlook. Um, and, and I can't say that we have such a separation of law and state now that that shouldn't form part of the thinking as well in terms of timing. And I think that's unfortunate. And then in relation to regrettees, uh, I think it's interesting when you talk about people in terrorist groups because people, and particularly ISIS actually, people 
perhaps struggle to understand there is a scale within that. So first of all, if we just accept that anyone who's part of that group is a membership of a terror group that is perpetrating genocide, that's just a given. But within that, there is a scale. There are people who genuinely believe they were going to join an Islamic state, genuinely believe that, that what they were confronted with when they were there was not that. There are people who are absolutely abhorrent and committed heinous acts. And then there are others in between who got mixed up in it, you know, like Matthew from series one, who ended up being forced to be a propaganda piece for ISIS, or arguably Sam as well, right? So there's a whole scale within that that we struggle to process because we like binary narratives when we talk about people in terror groups. We don't like to see the human being in front of us. And so I think, before I throw it to Taz, like, when you think about it that way, what just becomes key is affording people due process because that is a process where every case is judged on its individual merits. And no matter what circumstance you talk about, when you remove due process, you set a really dangerous precedent. And if in specifics to these camps where we're leaving them, we know from 2003, 2004 Iraq, when you detain people, you do not treat them in a certain manner. You do not afford them their basic rights. It breeds an ideology, it breeds resentment, and that gave us ISIS, arguably. And currently we're doing that again, but now we're doing it with kids. And so that is sort of turning it up to 11. And that is going to give us some serious problems. And we've seen with Shamima Begum's best friend, Sharmina, she escaped the camp. She is back with ISIS. She's financing for that group. Recently, I've been sent evidence. I don't know this to be true, but it is suggested that she may have also been party to trying to encourage attacks in a country. Uh, so those are clear, you know, where this can go. So, you know, no matter what you think about this, the current situation does not work. Actually, last thing, and then I'll shut up. The grimmest uh, tale of why leaving them there doesn't work was, was put to me relatively recently by a member of the military which is we talk about the cost of bringing these people home, the cost of surveillance. Surveillance is extraordinarily expensive and extraordinarily man -hour. A lot of journalists like to imagine they're surveyed, they're not. It's very expensive. But as he put it, what is the cost of getting a jet to take off from Cyprus and dropping a £5,000 bomb on somebody in Idlib? That is an extraordinarily expensive cost. So even on a cost-benefit ratio, it doesn't start to make a lot of sense if you put it in a military setting. Will you tell us, Taz, from the legal point of view, a little bit about this neologism, regretties? Uh, no, I made it up. Um, so it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't have any legal sort of connotations to it. It just was a turn of phrase that I think best encapsulates the desire of the people who we're talking about without having to go into the entire spectrum of what background they are and what have you. It was just, it was an umbrella phrase that, that I used um, with Parliament, because you have to keep things simple with politicians, really. Um, but um, but I, actually, the document that was there that, that I used that phrase in was a, a sort of semi-white paper that we put together around the problem of people who will want to return. And that was in 2015, that document was put, put in front of Parliament. And the point was this, is that the, the grim um, algorithm of war is that when you have a war that is not a civil war, about 3% of the population die on average. When you, when you have a civil war, you have 25% of the population die. It's much, more, it's, it's much more deadly. But still, that leaves 75% of people you know, unmolested, which means that however many people went over to Syria, 75% of them are going to be problematic in terms of that you will have to deal with their return. And that number would be actually a higher number because they're likely to have children as well. So what we proposed was that the UK government you know, take the lead on this, speak with other European countries and actually try and put together a triage mechanism in Turkey, which is the closest country to the problem. They have their security services on the ground and they are also motivated to deal with the issue. So if we were working for a 
resolution in a forward-thinking way, we ought to be talking to the Turks about a triage process. You know, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't, I actually put, I put this document towards some security service people and the police as well. They came back to me and they said it's above their pay grade, but they have put it up, it's kicked it up the chain. And um, when I got the phone call that should me and Begum had returned, I, I got a phone call from one of those police officers. And he actually quite openly said to me, this is a different paradigm, that, you know, we're, we're going to find this a lot more difficult, really, to deal with, which was a bit of a heads up to what was coming. Uh, and I, just, I reminded him, do you remember that document five years ago? And uh, he goes, yeah, it's come to bite us on the arse. And it has. And it, you know, it was entirely foreseeable. Yeah. Thank you very much. Three more quick questions, and then we'll close. Um, got no gentleman? Sorry to be binary about this. You've asked a question already. <laughs> <laughs> You said they, I'm sorry, sorry. Any of these. Um, all right. Um. I love that you brought an Amazon package. I really know what's in it. <laughs> what did you order? Oh. It's Amazon, yeah. Um, person up there, person up there, person over there. Hi, hello. I, uh, my question will be really quick, and it's rather concerning, like the um, jurisdiction, jurisdiction under which uh, Shamima is right now. I mean, like the Euro, she was deprived from her citizenship in 2000, uh, in uh, 2019, and it has been already like several years. And I'm curious under which status she is. She's like the Euro stateless, and if yes, like what, what is going on? Are there like any further steps on that she or her legal team is trying to obtain in order to kind of like? give back her citizenship or like what is going on further, what are the further steps for her in that case? Okay, let's change the format quickly. Could you answer that one? Yeah, sure. Um, if you come out from behind the bush, I feel like David Attenborough there. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but in, in, ter in terms of... Um, in terms Your of subtlety is just... <laughs> right, yeah. the, her, her legal status is, according to the British government, that she is the problem of the, Bang the, state, you know, the Bangladeshi government, basically. They... They say that because of the operation of Bangladeshi law, that at the time when they stripped her of citizenship, she would have been able to avail herself of Bangladeshi citizenship. Now, that is a de jure argument, which is in pure law. The de facto position is, of course, she's stateless. The very next day, the Bangladeshi government, A, contested the, the British government's legal reading of Bangladesh's law, you know, you would have thought the Bengalis know their law a bit better than, than us. But, uh, but uh, A, they contested that, and B, they also stated, the, the foreign minister stated that um, should she return or be found in Bangladesh, she's likely to be executed. Um, be, beyond that, w what her status is, 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 is that de facto, in, in actual reality, she has no state. You know, she cannot she cannot apply, or she's tried to apply actually, for leave to enter the UK in order to take part in the process of giving evidence to the court. The Court of Appeal thought that's quite important. The idea that you have a right to a fair trial um, was an important right and that she should be allowed to, to enter into the UK to, to take part in that. Um, the Supreme Court overturned that. So in the, the process of whether her challenge to her <coughs> Citizenship being revoked is ongoing, um, and while, until that process is concluded, you know, roots and branch concluded, then her status is still as a potential UK citizen, but not a UK citizen at the moment. There is also a geographical legal context you need to understand, which very quickly is that she is, it benefits authorities. If you remember the CIA black site program, possibly, or if not, go and read about it. It was taking people to countries that had questionable human rights records or legal jurisdictions where it was hard to protect them legally. Where Shamima Begum is now is northeastern Syria, but it's northeastern Syria that is under the control of a Kurdish militia that is our ally but isn't officially recognised as a, a sort of state, a nation state. So it's technically under the authority of Assad, who's obviously a dictator, but he's not in control. So you just have, in essence, a legal black hole geographically. What was the second question, sorry? Yeah. Up there. Thanks, Salima. 
Hi, this kind of builds on what you were just saying, but I'm quite curious. In the way that the podcast was produced, I think in one of the last episodes, you talked about the camp itself and how it kind of extended beyond the eye into the desert, which was quite visually compelling. And I'm curious in terms of how people responded to the podcast. Most of the podcast is focused around Shamima Begum, obviously, but it seems to me that in the last two episodes, you really did try to speak about the the people in the camp, the kids and how they reacted to you and also the radicalization that was happening within the camp. And in terms of me and listening, that was a huge takeaway is the radicalization itself that's occurring and continues to occur in the camp. And I'm just curious in terms of the response to your series and ongoing, how has how have people responded to that to the radicalization that you speak about in the podcast? And is that a conversation that is bypassed or avoided? Or, and how did you grapple with that? I'm really glad, sorry. I'm really glad that you pick up on that because, you know, as I keep saying, we are doing something here to children. And no matter what you think of their parents, children do not deserve to be burdened by the decisions of their parents. Um, in terms of the response to that in the series, I don't think a lot of people were aware that these camps were factoring that, but also these children's association with ISIS makes that becoming a sort of popular issue very difficult. I also, on the side, do policy work outside of journalism where I consult or, or try to help. And somebody asked about also if a change of government happens, are we going to see a shift? There are NGOs at the moment working on trying to repatriate children. You get into issues of child separation from parents and things like that, so it becomes very problematic. But they are certainly hopeful that under a change of government, they will have more success. I think it's hard to see Keir Starmer in his first 100 days deciding to bring Shamima Begum home. It'd be an interesting policy choice. I'm not sure it would make him very popular. So I think it's a very long road ahead. I think I would point to our European neighbours as possibly having a more approach that you would see as more progressive. And then in terms of reaction to the series overall... Um, we got an awful lot of complaints from the press release we put out before the series, which was just announcing that we were doing it, that manifested into uh, death threats for me and my family, um, people threatening to boil my head and things like that, and then finding out that I'm okay and changing their mind. But as the series progressed, uh, that dropped off. And actually people, for what you said earlier, because we weren't trying to make a judgment did seemingly, and I'm not just saying this, start to change their perspective and and have been extraordinarily complimentary and we still get hundreds of messages a week, uh, which for the most part are very lovely and I'm very grateful for that. It was definitely harder than... I knew it would be hard, but it was it was it it took its toll, definitely. So just to be clear, would you consider Keir Starmer a change of government? <laughs> Anyone who wants to talk to Taz about here, he's got a lot of, a lot of time. Uh, I can't have a political opinion. Question three, question three, yeah. Um, yeah, another question for Josh. Um, I've been thinking about what you were saying about consent, and particularly with um, regards to how you, before you interviewed Shamima, and, and you felt it was really important to get her consent. Um, how did that work when you were interviewing her husband? Um, and what do you think his motivations would have been for speaking to you? Really good question. Uh, so interestingly, Sara was there for that shoot as well, so she can talk about it more afterwards if people want to ask. The, so in, in essence, the men are held, just a quick bit of context, in kind of a really dark facility. It is a partially British-funded facility in an area of northeast Syria where the conditions are really bad. And we went there to see a number of different people. And in essence, you are confronted with a very difficult situation. It's always hard interviewing prisoners. I don't like it. Um, and one of the things that I try to immediately do, because they're brought into the room blindfolded, right? They have no control or concept of where they are in time. What I mean about this, some of these people went into prison in 2019. They don't have much concept of the outside world since then. There's a restriction on how much I'm allowed to tell them for security reasons, it's deemed. So the first thing I try to do is genuinely put them in control. You know, it's similar to when you're interviewing a survivor of sexual violence. The one thing that's been taken from them is control. 
so you really do need to put them in control you do need them to understand genuinely they can say no to you and that is okay and to the extent we did have one person who sat with me we talked he said it's not for me and we said fine and he left very frustrating because i know he knows something that i really wanted to know but we had to do it <laughs> with yago um i still to this day don't fully understand exactly why he said yes but again it was a similar thing of like i'm not going to always agree with you but i will be fair and i think you're also seeing somebody there that is still caught within a fairly radical ideology right you know his perception of women and a woman's place is abuse it absolutely is again no matter what you think about shimmy begum that was an abusive relationship and I never expected him to be so candid. And there were things, there were times when he would answer and I would turn and look at Sarah and her mouth would be open. And I would turn and look at Joe and we couldn't believe it, but he would keep going. But I think that's fundamentally because he still believes in a lot of what the state stood for. And he said some really abhorrent things that we didn't put in. He's in that, I've interviewed a lot of violent people. And normally it's, I'm not, he's in that like 5% that I find genuinely intimidating and really problematic. He's not a big guy, you know, physically he doesn't, but he's, he, I do believe he poses a risk. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask Sarah to come and sit here and give us the, give us the last word. Um, Taz, do you want to, do you want to say anything um, while Sarah's coming up the steps about, about anything that's been discussed? Well, I um, hope you found it all very interesting so far. Uh, I, when somebody gives me carte blanche, I fear, I fear myself. Um, but I'll pass it over to Sarah now. Just very quickly, um, we'll obviously answer whatever you guys want to talk about and stick around. I will run to the loo quickly beforehand, but thank you so much for coming. It really does mean a lot to us that you all turned up and, and chose to speak. But I also am conscious that I'm really glad Sarah's here. I'm the loud mouth. Storytelling really is a team game and there is Sarah, there is Joe. There's an inordinate amount of people behind this that really gave everything they could to do it. And not only that, there's the trust of contributors like Taz, that none of this would have worked without Taz, without the trust of Shamima. So there's, it's a huge project with a lot of people behind it and there's an awful lot of gratitude from me towards you for being here, but also to people like Taz and Shamima and others who who entrusted us with their story, and indeed to Sarah for telling me what to do. Okay, it was great. Sarah, talk to us. Uh, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I mean, does anyone have a question? I don't know. What do you want, to, what do you want me to say? Well it's, <laughs> well, it's just that you obviously are the backbone, or possibly you're the backbone of the project. I th it's a team effort, for yeah, sure. Yeah. But, yeah. I think one of the things that was interesting when Sarah came onto this, so Sarah is uh, Jordanian, uh, uh, studied in America, dual citizenship, so came at it from a slightly different perspective where you hadn't grown up with the sort of Shamima Begum narrative just being there in the same way, so you had a slightly different perspective to it when you first came to it, didn't you? Yeah, I think for me, being fairly new to the UK, I learned a lot about this country while working on this story. Um, and I didn't really expect uh, the degree of polarization that I was witnessing. Um, and I just want to kind of bring it back to what Josh said about us doing this for the BBC. I think um, for me, I was really thankful that we had to be objective because sometimes we'd be in a room, Josh, myself and Joe, and we'd listen to something that Shamima said and we would each interpret it differently or react to it differently. Sometimes we'd have debates between ourselves about where we stand on certain things and we kind of come at it from very different worlds and backgrounds. Um, and at the end of the day, we were able to tell a story that the three of us were very proud of, I think. So like, it was, it was definitely the best way, I think, for us to make sure that it resonates with as many people as possible. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, but I'm really thankful that all of you guys l 
who did listen to the podcast and watch the documentary um, enjoyed it. And just, I was trying to get Josh to say this, but he didn't understand or lip read properly. But if you are more curious about Muhammad Rashid, then episodes two and three of the podcast really tell you a lot more. And I'm in it, so. <laughs> I agree. You are in it. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think we probably should begin to draw this to a close. Um, my sense in watching the film was actually that maybe you also, as a team, and with your <coughs> discussions, you, you presumably helped her to formulate some of her identity a bit more clearly because... As, as the film progresses, you can def I think, am I imagining this? Or do you, I think I saw her being able to articulate a bit more clearly the fact that she was no longer that 15-year-old and that she could be self-critical <coughs> and that she could be critical of ISIS. I mean, I don't know who else she would have said this to, but, she, but you found her and you were able to provide an audience for her. And I don't know if, that, if that's correct or am I over... Over dramatizing. Do you want me to go? Do you want to go? Yeah, go, you go first. I think we had the privilege of spending an awful lot of time with Shamima, and that allowed us to develop a rapport. But it also, what you don't see is sometimes the degree that I am having to push her in certain to really drill down into what she means and what she thinks. And there are reasons for that that I can't talk about publicly. Um, but having that time to do that and having that ability to do that in a fair way that isn't forceful, but it's to like, what do you mean by that? Let's let's revisit that as a concept. The time was essential to us being able to present a Shamima that was slightly different to the news headlines or what you'd seen in three minute interviews, I think. And the time was essential for us to also see where she stood on things with time because you could also see her evolution of thought on certain subjects and then kind of... And the inconsistencies, out. right? And the inconsistencies, for sure. Yeah. Of which there are, and there are things that she would rather leave out. She's not without sin, but there is also context to that, right? <coughs> Taz, do you have any comments about family work? Or working with the fa Sorry, do you have any comments about working with the family? It's, this, it's a bit emotional. I mean, the, the, the problem is, is the families have been taken on the most horrific roller coaster journey as well over the years. There were points where they were convinced their daughter was dead. They were getting reports where their daughter's friends were dead. Yeah. Um, and every time a, a court case comes up, hope is raised. You can imagine the sort of bending of the emotions that happen until the point of failure. And there have been points of failure in the family members that are there. It's caused tidal um, differences of opinions about certain things and family members also are not talking to each other so whatever this has been the, the cost of this to the individuals involved the cost of this to the wider families we really should take the lesson in that and think about what sort of a future we have some responsibility for before putting people through this and understanding where we've let ourselves come to. Um, and you're all young. It's going to affect you more. That's what I have to say. That's a sobering, that's a sobering thought. Um, where's Nina? Nina, where are you? Nina, come, come, come. So I would like to conclude the evening by thanking our panel. They're absolutely amazing. But also, they're only here because of Nina. And, uh, Can we give Nina. a round of applause to Nina? Um, I, I, I know we've run over time, so I don't want to babble on or anything. But, um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you very much for, um, for coming. Um, and, of course, to Josh and Tasneem. Um, this is a, a topic which, because uh, my background is in journalism as well, and I've, I've sort of delved into kind of motivations behind um, p 
people who go off and join ISIS. So it, for me, it's something that I've, I'm quite kind of invested in as well. But um, yeah, it's nice to see that, that people are, are interested and, and make the time to come out. And please keep coming. We're going to do more events like this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.